So I just want to recap. This is a Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council General Board meeting, uh, Thursday, October 6th at 6.24 p.m. For the record, the meeting started at 11. Okay. Right. Okay, so we're gonna uh, see, are there any more uh, government or uh, elected officials with announcements for our community? Or we have Cynthia Cruz. Okay, two minutes here. Okay, two minutes, Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Good evening. So, uh, Cynthia Cruz here from uh, Councilmember De Leon's office. I just wanted to hop on to give you guys a quick up, uh, just some announcements and quick updates about some stuff that are coming up. Um, so, first of all, last week we had our dedicated cleaning crews come out and help us clean a large portion on Main Street and our staff were out um, as well, helping our crews. Um, and it was a pretty successful cleanup from uh, Main Street, all, from starting at Johnson Street all the way down to Daly. Um, so they cleared a lot of weeds and just street sweeping, bulky items, all that stuff along Main Street. Um, so that was a great cleanup there. Um, and then I wanted to share with you guys that this Saturday, uh, October 8th at 10 a.m. Our office is going to be hosting a groundbreaking for the new playground at Lincoln Park. Um, so wanted to extend an invitation to, to you guys and any community members that are on the line. Um, that's this Saturday at 10 a.m. It'll be a quick uh, groundbreaking ceremony. Um, and then, yeah, so you guys are welcome to attend that. I have a flyer that I can share with the board um, and it's also up on our social media accounts and everything. So uh, if you guys wanna come out for that, the, the playground that's getting replaced is the one that's by the Dodger Dream Field. So uh, if you guys have something, uh, you guys don't have anything to do, if you guys wanna come by, that's this Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, and then um, also wanted to share that on Sunday, uh, October 9th, we're going to be having a pet clinic out at Ascot Hills Park um, by the flagpole. Um, usually starts about 10 a.m. So if anyone has any pets or, you know, that are due for their shots, uh, bring them by Ascot Hills Park. There's going to be a pop-up pet clinic there. Um, and yeah, just wanted to share that we're um, gearing up for all of the holiday events that are quickly approaching, all of our Halloween events. Um, Veterans Day events, uh, turkey distributions, and uh, Christmas events. Um, this uh, for Lincoln Park on the 31st will be at uh, Lincoln Park Rec Center, um, and there'll be a lot of good activities there for kids, pumpkin painting, um, and other crafts, and um, candy and all of that stuff. So that's on the 31st. If you guys don't have the flair, also share that. Um, and then again, for the month of November, um, every, every year we do have a turkey distribution. So um, we're getting all of our, all of our lists um, up, updated for this year. So if you guys have you know, a request for any turkeys, um, we're more than happy to provide a, a couple of turkeys to the Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council so that you guys can distribute to community members or if you guys just want to send community members out to our distribution, it happens every year. Um, and as we approach that distribution, I can share more information about that. But yeah, just a heads up, we uh, will have turkeys that will be distributing for uh, Thanksgiving. Um, and then another reminder that um, we do have, um, I'm sure you guys saw the uh, eviction moratorium was um, the council voted to um, end the eviction moratorium and um, that that's going to be January 2023 at the end of January and with it came some other provisions and amendments and if you guys want more information about that feel free to reach out to me or to our office so we can give you the latest and also wanted to say we have a dedicated uh, email for any tenants that might need any support or resources or services or just want to know their tenant rights during this time. And that email is cd14renterhelp at lacity.org. So again, cd14renterhelp at lacity.org. 
Um, and you guys can also feel free to reach out to me for any further questions so that we can um, just, you know, clarify what all of that, um, what the new provisions and amendments will be to that. Um, but yeah, that's all I wanted to share. Um, and I'll be on for a little while. And if you guys have any questions, just let me know. Oh, oh I'll share my email actually, just in case someone doesn't have it on here. Um, it's Cynthia, C Y N T H I A dot B as in Victor dot Cruz, C R U Z at LACity dot org. All right, cool. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any other uh, government reports? Please raise your hand or press star nine. We have Goat Puppet. Oh, that's, he's not a, okay, wait. Uh, we're at government reports right now. Yeah. Right? So um, we already went past the uh, community announcements. So we can't take that comment right now, right? Vince? Correct. Uh, we just got them. We already closed those and we're on uh, government reports and we're closing that. And then now it's item five. Okay, so no more government reports, no more elected officials on the horn. Nope. We have Sarah Kim. Okay, Sarah Kim. Hi. Um, I actually I thought the meeting was starting at um, 630, but I had a just a really quick community comment if I would be able to add it. Well, well, Sarah, if we if we allow that, if we allow Sarah, we have to allow both. Yeah, yeah, sure. OK, yeah. OK. So um, it's just really quick. Um, I am on behalf of parents, educators, teachers and students in action. And I just wanted to say that um, I applied for a uh, neighborhood purpose grant. Um, but Mr. Montalvo, I'm having trouble um, reaching you. Um, uh, could you just let me know if it, my application was received? The, let me see. Yes, it was. It's a, it went to the it went to my spam box, but I'll, I'll respond to you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, and then we'll go back to puppet. Puppet. <laughs> Yes. So she wants to know where her money is. Where's the money? Where's the goddamn money? <laughs> Zuma dog. Correct, sir. That's a quote from the great Zuma dog. Yes. So the reason I'm late, I was listening to the mayor's debate just now between Rick Caruso, the FBI snitch. And Karen Bass, the FBI target. <laughs> what an amazing race. Yes. Now, who does Goat Puppet want to win? <laughs> well, Karen Bass. Right. And why? Well, because we want her to become the first elected mayor to be indicted the day after she wins. That's right. Nothing but more family entertainment. <laughs> now, of course, would this board vote for Rick Caruso? No, 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 no. No, you wouldn't do that. He'd be fixing problems. You don't want that. <laughs> we want more chaos. Yes. So, as we know, there's an application that Karen Bass has for her USC free education. And KFI asked her, KNX, I'm sorry, KNX asked her, do you have it? And she says, Yes. And he says, will you turn on over tonight so the public can see it? She said, no, I'll turn it over when I want to. <laughs> and all of you are going to vote for Karen Bass. Shame on this board. Shame on this community. But at least, as I said, Kevin DeLeon loves all of you. But Gil, where's he at? He still hates you, yes. Now, will our new CD1 rep, will she show up to these meetings and show her compassion for you? Or is she just going to be another one of these slugs? We'll find out. Yes. <laughs> right, yeah. right. That's right. 
We're going to get a new mayor. She's going to she's gonna be carried past and then gets indicted the next day. <laughs> yes, how exciting. I can't wait. <laughs> you pop, Mr. Pup, Pupper, Puppet. All right. So, uh, any other government announcements? Elected officials, city, please. We Would don't you? see any. All right. So, we're going to move on to the next item some uh, action stuff. So, uh, five uh, discussion, possible action on approval of minutes, majority vote. So, uh, A, C, and D are going to be uh, extended to the next meeting. So, we have. Uh, Item 5C, uh, oh wait, no, sorry. I, item 5B, uh, discussion of possible action on approval minutes, May 27th, 2021 general board. So we have that as a supporting document and we have to kind of just do a majority vote on that quickly. Okay, so I'd like to make the motion to approve uh, agenda item 5B. Do I have a second? I second. Selena second. Okay. Sarah, just board discussion and then uh do we have to pull up the document or yeah it's like the board should, uh, can somebody pull it up from the uh google drive it will be on the agenda where it says like supporting docs here yeah so it'll be a 5c or b sorry uh yeah draft minutes well, this is old The item was, that's it. Yeah, that's what's, um... that's it. So, um, yeah. So any board member discussion on this item? I don't have any. Any uh, community member discussion on this item? Please raise your hand and press star nine. Okay, we got somebody's hand up here. We have Co Puppet. Co Puppet, two minutes. I counted on you. You failed me. Three out of four meeting minutes not prepared. Shame on you. You're starting to look like these other neighborhood councils I go to. That's not the LHNC way. No. You guys don't do that here. No, you're not involved in a criminal cover up. No, there's no reason not to have the minutes. And where are the public speakers and the names of the public speakers? <laughs> they should be proudly displayed on your minutes and what they said. <laughs> but I don't see that. I just see X's and little check marks and boats. This makes no sense. This was done by lazy people. You should pay somebody to do this. Like for example, the Van Nuys Neighborhood Council spends eight to ten thousand dollars a month on a website lady that does it. She's my favorite charity case, yes. And we support that. You should hire somebody in the community to do your minutes so they can bill you four, five, six, seven hundred dollars a month. It, it'll stimulate the economy and take the pressure off of you. Yes. <laughs> Go puppet moves to reopen the other three meetings. And unfortunately, since Sarah has a cat, she gets two votes, one for her and one for the animal. <laughs> That's very right. Yes. Look it up. It's in your bylaws. <laughs> Thank you, puppet. All right. So any other uh, com community uh, comment on the minutes? Please raise your hand and press star nine. I don't see any. Okay, with that, we're gonna move on to a vote. Uh, so we had a first and a second. Who was the first, just so I can do the minutes better? I moved, I moved and Selena second. Okay, and then so uh, we're gonna do a sort of majority vote. So can we do that on these minutes? Yeah, all in favor. Let's, let's do that, so Fernanda. All in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. I'm not opposing, but I just remembered that my funding expired a week ago. 
and it's not um, updated. So I don't know actually if I have to um, update it. No, not for this thing. I got this just a minute. Okay, so for funding, I have to abstain. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I can't for corn. Okay. Ineligible for funding. Yeah, so we're going to go. So the motion carries, right? Correct, Fernanda? We have a majority vote on the minutes? Yes. Motion carries. The minutes are that date. We're going to other minutes to the next meeting. So we have, uh, now we're going to move on to item number six, funding item. Item number 6A. So Vince, you want to take the ball here? Yeah, I'll do the same thing. Uh, I'd like to make a motion on item number 5D to approve the minutes. Do I have a second? Wait, no, not the minutes. Vince, we're on funding, so it's the MER. Oh, you were, oh, so, but we were, we only did one of the uh, the uh, minutes. Okay, we have all to do the other second. ones are tabled. I made the announcement before we started. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. uh, we're on six, so funding items. And then we can pull, let's pull up the documents for the three items. Um, so the, it's item 6A, the August MER. Well, first, yeah, the MER, just pull up the MER first. Such a nerd. All right, there we go. So this is our monthly expenditure to this date. Uh, our public storage is our most expensive one, uh, but we do have our monthly, uh, the mail room, which does our contact and website updates. Um, so currently our, our total expenses were $601.25, which were already paid. And you, can you scroll down just a little bit more, Fernanda? So that's our receipt for public storage. And then we should have one more receipt for the, um, $155 and that should be it. So just two items this uh, for this uh, August. <laughs> and that's just the the, the uh, internet receipt for it, but. So, um, all right, so uh, Vince, because of time restrictions, can I limit the board member and community comments on like the funding items or no? On the planning items? No, on the on these items. Yeah, I mean, you can just lock it down to one minute for public and board comments so we can okay. go through. Because these are kind of, yeah, okay, so one minute for public and board comments. So any board members have any comments? Well, on first, the first, let okay. me make a motion to approve the August 22 MER monthly expenditure report. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, okay. okay. now. Public comment, I mean, board comment and public comment, Sarah. Okay, any board members have any comments? Please raise your hand or speak. One minute. I don't see any. Okay, so we're going to go to uh, public comments on this item. One minute. Please we raise have your hand. Go. Yeah, sorry. Please raise your hand or press star nine if you would like to comment on this item. We have Go Puppet. The Go Puppet? Yes, you should be using Wendy Moore, M-O-O-R-E, for your internet usage. Yes, she only charges five, six, seven hundred dollars a month, and she does all your webcasting instead of this measly one hundred thirty-five dollars. <laughs> yes, you need to get into that business. Yes. Other than that. I can't find anything wrong with it. I I vetted this. I went through our accounting department. So we must concede that Vincent has passed the ethics on this. And we urge an eye vote. <laughs> that, that makes you sad, right? Well, sometimes you got to give them one. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. So this is going to be a roll, a roll vote. Everyone has to... Uh, respond to it because it's a funding item. Um, I'm going to go down the list. Sarah? Okay, so wait, do we have any more public comments on the item? No, I don't think we have, we don't have okay. anybody else with their hand up. Okay, Gil, can you mute, please? And anybody? All right, so we're going to do a roll call vote on this item? Yes. So we have a first and a second by? I motion and Fernanda second. 
Okay, and then we're gonna do a majority vote, correct? Yeah. No, this is a one by one. This one has to oh, be- Oh, one by one. Okay, so- item. All right. Ready? Secretary Sanchez? Oh, I thought it was Vincent since it's a yeah, funding this, item. This one I gotta do because it's a funding oh, item. Okay, I'll, right on. Let's I'll roll. down the line. Sarah? Yes. Ben? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Montalvo? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Benny? Yes. Didia? Absent. Okay, absent. Karen? Ineligible. Anna Lee? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. Diego? Absent. Richard? Absent. Gil? Yes. Steve? Yes. Selena? Ineligible. Okay, and Sylvia? I need to abstain. I'm ineligible as well. Okay. Okay, motion passes. Motion carries. Okay, so we'll move on to funding item 6B. Okay. So recently, I'll open this one up. So recently we partnered up with Hazard Park. They have their um, Halloween day on October the 28th. Outreach is gonna be posting the table out. And so uh, we were asked to see if we can um, provide some candy, they were, they were short. And so I said, Let, let's bring it to the board and see. So that's what you have before you today. Um, it's a lot of candy. They're expecting anywhere between uh, three to 350 kids. So it's a lot. So we have a budget up uh, fifteen up to fifteen hundred dollars for the event. So I make a motion that we approve funding up to a hundred one thousand five hundred dollars for the Hazard Park Recreation Center uh, Halloween event for October twenty eighth, twenty twenty two. Is there a second? Second. Oh, second. Sarah, uh, board member comments. Yeah, so any, um, so we're gonna do a one minute one again. So um, any board member comments on this item? <laughs> no? Okay, so- uh, Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll make a comment. Yeah, okay. No, I just think it's important. Anytime we get an opportunity to engage and interact with the community of uh, Hazard Park and Ramona Gardens, um, I think it's important. So it, it, this is uh, a lot more meaningful than just, you know, candy. You know, it's engaging, it's outreaching, and um, it's, um, you know, getting to know uh, the community uh, better along with its needs. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. Yeah, I'll make a comment. Yeah, it's like there's uh, different communities that now are involved maybe in other neighborhood council districts or um, might have no representation. In that case, it's like Ramona Gardens, right? They have no neighborhood council, but historically they've been a part of Lincoln Heights and they are Lincoln Heights, uh, just geographically. And they went to Lincoln High School, even Rose Hill. Uh, so uh, when we talk about the park, that's Lincoln Heights, you know? And um, they have a rec center just like Lincoln Park and all our other things. So this is an event. And uh, yeah, it's for all the community. Yeah, super important. That's all I have to say. Any other board member comments? I don't see any. Any public comments on this item? One minute. I don't see any hands up. Oh, we have call Lynn user. Please press star nine to unmute yourself. All right. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I was uh, concerned about the Halloween. I understand Halloween is more of a pagan holiday. Wouldn't it? Be
be more better to uh, be associated with a festival regarding Dia de los Muertos because of its cultural significance and the more meaning of um, honoring those that have passed, members of the community, members of family, especially since it's, we're on the third year of the pandemic, that in consideration of this, thank you. Thank you very much. And if I could just comment on that. Yeah, so last year, Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council held a friend at uh, Church of the Epiphany, and we're going to be doing it again this year. And that is later in the month, uh, November 2nd-ish. So I, everybody should attend again to commemorate our community members lost. Uh, any other uh, public comment? One minute. Thank you. We, I do not see any hands raised. All right. Okay, so I'll start the roll call for it. Here we go. Everyone has to answer, okay? Uh, Sarah? Yes. Ben? Yes. Yes. Vincent? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Okay. Uh, Benny? Yes. Didius, absent. Uh, Jared? Ineligible. Annalise? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. Gil? Yes. Okay. Uh, Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Ineligible. Ineligible. Sorry. Let me just get that one out. Okay. And then Sylvia, ineligible, correct? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Motion carries. Motion carries. Motion carries. All right. So we'll move on to funding item uh, 6C. Vince? Okay. This item is for outreach. Uh, it's a request for a button maker. And this is just to do more of our outreach as things get more expensive. It, it, it's, it's crazy on how the price for these uh, buttons are. So it's a great opportunity for us to invest something that we can produce on multiple campaigns that the neighborhood council uh, can have, right? Whether it's uh, renters rights or committee any of the committees would have access to print something out as a button. So I think it's a good investment for us. And what you have before you is the breakdown, which is the, the actual button maker that does every, anything from one inch all the way up until three, three inches and supplies. So enough supplies for people to come up with in their committees mm -hmm. and what they think to, so that they can do some outreaching with buttons towards the community and see how it works out. They usually do pretty well for people. Cool. So I'd like to make a motion to approve the five up to five hundred dollars for a button maker with supplies. Second. Okay, Ben seconds. We're gonna open it up for public and board comment. We're gonna do one minute again. We'll do board members first. Please raise your hand or speak if you have a comment on the pins. I don't see any hands raised. All right, we'll go to the public comments on this item. Please raise your hand or press star nine if you would like to comment on this item. I don't see any hands raised. All right. Vince? Okay, here we go. We're gonna go down. Sarah Clendenny? Yes. Ben? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Vincent, yes. Nancy? Yes. Penny? Yes. Didia Thompson, Jared, ineligible. Okay. Anna Lee? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. Thank you. Diego's absent. Uh, Richard Ortiz is absent. Gil? Uh, no, when we can get it for free from Ben. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Steve. Yes. Selena. Uh, in algebra. Okay, and okay, so we have uh, Sylvia is also in eligible. Motion carries. Carries. Guys, thank you very much. All right. So now we're going to move on to the next item. <clears throat> Executive committee, item number seven. Announcement of board members not up to date with certifications. So uh, I guess I'll make the announcement. Yeah, so Sylvia, that is all sorted. It was a back end issue. Um, so you can get your cornerstone. And then I guess, yeah, <laughs> Selena, I don't know. I guess any, anybody who's not up to date, you have to look on the Empower LA Lincoln Heights site and see. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll double, triple check again. Some of the members from who were here like uh, prior to uh, the last election, some of the things are expiring. So if you were a member from before last May, just double check your uh, status, especially on the funding. Um, and that's, there's no action on this item. Um, somebody's got their audio on. But uh, Sarah, Jared had his hand up. Yeah, Jared. Briefly, thank you. Uh, is there a better contact to talk to the training coordinators to, I've been locked out of the software. I was cruising along and I have sent uh, two emails and I have received no response. So if anybody has any advice in how to contact them so I could finish my training, I'm all ears. Thank you. Oh yeah. We can share. Did you contact Jose Galdemez? I did. Okay. I'll go ahead and follow up with him. Hopefully I get a response from him. Thank you. Um, very much. And he'll let me know if there's somebody else we need to contact. Yeah. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool. So we're going to move on to announcement of LHNC vacancies, item number uh, 7B. I'm going to announce the vacancies real quick. So we need a youth rep, 2025. So that's a high school student at any of our high schools. Um, or, yeah, it's the age is what? Ben, is it 14 to, to 18? I think it's. 16. It says in our bylaw. Uh, so we need two business reps, one ending 2025, 20, one ending 2023. We need two community-based org reps, one ending in 2023, one ending in 2025. We need three, uh, one area three rep resident, who's a resident, and that ends in 2023. We need one area four representative resident, 2023. One area six representative resident, ending in 2023. And so on the agenda, we have a link to the bylaws and also as a supporting doc, we have two things. We have an application and like all of the criteria for stakeholdership. Um, so I'm gonna move on to item number seven, B2. Uh, discussion and possible action to appoint stakeholders to the following vacancies. So uh, Secretary Sanchez, have we received any applications for any vacancies? I have not received any applications. Vince or Ben, have you received any? I have not received any. Okay. We did receive an inquiry uh, at the last, at the XCOM in which I, I re I've replied with the info for that person. Okay, so we're going to um, move off of, off of this item because we have no applicants, correct? So we're gonna move on to the next item. Item number eight, presentations. Is Michael Hayden? Oh, there he is. Okay, so item number eight. Number eight A, presentation regarding Welch's industrial dry cleaning property, the dry cleaner's property at 3505 Pasadena Avenue across from Hillside Elementary. Um, presenter Michael Hayden, Lincoln Heights Community Coalition. So uh, Michael, if you wanna give like sort of a, a little um, presentation here about what's going on at the site. Michael, you have been promoted to panelist. Hi, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Hi. Um, 
Thanks for having me. This is Michael Hayden uh, from the Lincoln Heights Community Coalition. Um, so if I could share really quickly um, what I've learned in the fast, past few weeks about the former Welch's property at 3505 Pasadena Avenue at Avenue 35. Um, this is the property directly touching the Avenue 34 project. The Avenue 34 project developers are using it as their parking lot and staging area. This is the site that first clued us into the fact that the Avenue 34 site was likely contaminated um, because it was an industrial dry cleaner since before 1920, owned by the Welch family, operated until the late 80s. Uh, at one point, they called themselves America's largest dry cleaner. Um, and they also operated a truck refueling station. And uh, in the late 80s, they discovered that uh, the, the ground was being contaminated by uh, leaking underground storage tanks on the site. The buildings were demolished, and the site has been under cleanup uh, for decades and the site has been vacant during that time. Um, groundwater monitoring wells were installed for several blocks and confirmed that the contamination is moving into the neighborhood. And the main uh, way that DTSC approved for cleanup here is called natural attenuation, which means just leave it alone, come back in a few years and test it again. And when all the stuff is dispersed out into the environment, uh, the new testing levels will be lower. Um, so that's what they did. They did some other remediation too, but that's been the main that's been the main uh, kind of remediation, um, so-called remediation. Um, so uh, they just issued a closure letter uh, a couple months ago and released a uh, land use covenant. Um, that's a restriction that says that the site is too contaminated to use for housing. Uh, as soon as that happened, the owners of the property put it up for sale. Uh, there's some confusion about who the owners are. Um, it might be Aramark, which is what DTSC says, uh, which is a huge corporation, but whoever owns it has recorded it under the name of the Welch family with LA County has been paying property taxes under that name for decades. So we're trying to figure that out. In any case, a huge real estate firm offered it for sale. DTSC approved some geotechnical testing last month um, by a company called Zebec Pursuits. They own a bunch of industrial buildings in California. And they told DTSC that they plan to build a 60,000 square foot warehouse on the property. If that's actually their plan, this could mean that a thousand, you know, hundreds up to a thousand big rig diesel trucks could be moving in and out of the site every day, directly uh, next to and across the street from thousands of residents. Diesel truck fumes are one of the main contributors to the already terrible air quality in Lincoln Heights, which makes us one of the California's, um, you know, worst for air pollution and, and environmental standards. Um, this would be across the street from Hillside Elementary. The main student crosswalk is right at the driveway to the Welch's property. Um, there are also five schools within half a mile. You know, Lots of the same things that impact Avenue 34 would be the same for here because it's right next door. Um, this would be a disaster from both a health and safety perspective. And um, I wanna ask everyone here to think about ways that this site could be used instead for the benefit of the community. Um, one thing uh, we've learned is that there have been multiple plans over the years to build a park at this property. There was a plan commissioned by the state uh, just a few years ago that suggested a park. There was apparently a city plan to make it a park uh, sometime around 2000. And um, there was also a county plan to make this a park. I don't know why it never happened, um, but it's been used, that plan has been used over the years to get funding for this neighborhood and that funding was never used to clean up or benefit this property. Um, I think it would be a great spot for a community center with outdoor space. And I know that right now there are several possible funding streams to make something like that happening. Um, the new federal infrastructure bill um, provides money for remediation of brownfields and it provides money for new parks. And I know that uh, Jimmy Gomez is already using some of that money to make a park in Boyle Heights. Um, something similar could possibly happen here. Uh, there's a state fund that was just announced this past year um, that provides something like half a billion dollars to clean up former dry cleaners, specifically in underserved neighborhoods. This would qualify as, as that. Um, there's also Department of Energy funding at the federal level for community resiliency centers. Those would be like community centers that are solar powered and could you know, benefit the community in times of earthquakes or heat waves, things like that. The way I see it, the important thing is that right now the site has been inflicting harm on Lincoln Heights for generations. 
And we have a unique opportunity to ensure that rather than further polluting this neighborhood, instead the site could get cleaned up more and then serve a purpose that would be beneficial and restorative to the community. Um, I've been reaching out to anyone I can think of who might be able to help. And already our county supervisor, Hilda Solis, has already said that she would like to help however she can. And I welcome any ideas and suggestions both from this board and from the community, the public, about how to move this in a beneficial direction. I think it would be a disaster to see this as a trucking depot um, across the street from an elementary school. And I'm sure there are better ways to put this site to you. Thank you. For Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for your informative presentation. Um, so, uh, do any board members have any questions for Michael? Like one minute or some comments? Uh, just, I guess my, my concern is even turning it into a park. I mean, we're dealing with contaminants that are forever contaminants. And I think that's one of the major problems we're going to see in the state that, you know, the like Taylor Yards being turned into a park. There's a huge amount of problems with it already. Um, this this needs more study. These pieces of land have been vacant for many years already because the city had already deemed that you could not build on here. To wave a magic wand without any, you know, scientific study or scientific solutions, what are we putting ourselves into to try to solve this problem? It's a bigger mess. But I think that's something we got to take into consideration when looking at these projects because um, yeah can i just respond to that really quickly um yeah. i agree completely with that and one of the things that bothers me right now about the way dtse has handled this is that they acknowledge how contaminated the site is but they've issued a site closure letter which means that potentially a company could come in and build a warehouse here they will not have to do any testing they will not have to do any remediation and this you know the forever chemicals that are here will continue to stay in the ground and pollute whoever works there and will continue to leach out into the surrounding community and the way i see it the only way to get any further remediation of this is for somebody to take control of it who has an interest in actually doing that and putting it to to better use um and so, so yeah, I, I completely agree with everything uh, that Vince just brought up. And, um, and you know, if, if the community doesn't get involved in what that direction is, um, I know that already somebody could come in by right and build something here without having to do any remediation. All right, I see Gil's hands up, Gil? I think this is a great opportunity for the uh, neighborhood council. Uh, we should take the reins on this, uh, jump on it right away for a, a committee or ad hoc committee or whatever to explore all these things. Uh, you can't wait for someone to come uh, for somebody else to do an action and uh, beat you to the punch. I mean, uh, this is a great things that he's bringing to us and we should jump right on it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Gil. Yeah. I just want to make a quick comment. It's like before we even discovered the 254 barrels of toxic waste buried on the Avenue 34 site that the city destroyed the documents about. Um, the Welch's site is like the um, one of the most, it's, it's the notorious toxic site in the Cornfield Arroyo specific plan because it operated as like the premier in industrial dry cleaners for like uh, what, 80, 60 years, whatever. Um, but uh, some elected public officials, like, okay, so this, in 2007, when Ed Reyes was working on the uh, LA River Plan, Cornfield Arroyo specific plan, in all the maps, and even in the bid map, they indicate that this site says future park, right? So in 2007, it went up in front of the Board of Supervisors to turn this into a park, and we're trying to look more into that, but Gloria Molina was involved, right? Gloria Molina was also involved in the Avenue 34 site under uh, model cities dating back to 1970, the mid 70s, right? So it's all, there's a lot of politicians involved in the site. It's a renowned toxic site on all the EIRs from the Metro to the 710 to everything the past 20 years. So uh, anyway, there's just data and everything with the EPA. Um, but we have to make sure like with the cast, 
since there's a covenant on this that they can't build any residential, correct? It's a restriction, a deed restriction. It's a it land use covenant that travels with the property. And so um, from the way I understand it, um, it can it cannot be used for residential unless somebody were to propose a huge cleanup project. But, um, and we've seen how DTSC handles that. Yeah, I mean, as we've been doing years of research on this stuff, and like, as you can see, it's like decade after decade, uh, information just disappears, right? And suddenly people are like, let's make it a park. Well, that's what they said 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and then the next councilman's elected and then everybody forgets or whatever. So uh, the thing is, yeah, it's good to make an ad hoc committee for this, yes. But also it's like, at what point, since the CASP was conceptual, uh, before the CASP existed in the LA River plan, this was uh, getting a lot of federal funds to be an industrial zone. That's when the Lincoln Heights industrial bid was formed and they were gonna make chain link fences with Checkpoint Charlie's because it was so toxic and all that. So now a lot of these industrial properties in there, like the trucking places and stuff, they're not really, there's no space for them in, within the CASP. So they're gonna be phased out. So it's like, do they want a trucking depot on this site? No, because they're building Avenue 34 next to it with 500 or 468 luxury condos. Do they want to park? Sure they do. So it's like, we want to park too. How do we make it so it's a park for the people and not an amenity to luxury development, which is what's happening with the cask with everything. And, and that's all I have to say. And we have a letter for the next thing, but, um, but thank you. Do, uh, any other board members have any comments? No, I'm gonna put my hand down. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna move on to the public. Anybody from the public have a comment on the, uh, this or this site or i mean questions from michael sorry no we have someone from the public daisy hi um so i like the idea um Thank you, Michael, for coming and sharing this information with us. I like the idea of a community center and having you heard, having heard uh, Sarah right now, Sarah, regarding like, you know, you guys were on top of this and um, it was just kind of ignored and no one followed up. How can, um, how can we make sure, like as a community, community member, how can we make sure that um, we can pick up where we last left off, where will um, follow up and make sure that maybe something positive happens with this piece of land. Because I like the idea of the community center instead of a park. Yeah. Thank you, Daisy. Michael, any comments on that? Well, uh, yeah, so I think it's a, I, I think it's a great idea too. Um, one of the challenges right now is that you know, the city doesn't own the property. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a challenge even just figuring out who does own the property and what the status of the sale is um, and whether, you know, it could be an escrow already. We don't know. It's, there's a lot of, it's, uh, it's very hard finding out that information. So, um, so right now um, I'm bringing it to the public because, you know, if anybody can help with research or anything, um, that would be welcome. But but I agree that that a community center or something like that that would serve the people who live around here um, would be the best thing for this site. And 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 hopefully we can find a way to get our elected leaders involved also to to help us. But yeah, it's right like, now it's, I'm just bringing information. I I don't know what the path forward is. Like when our ex elected public officials are still in the mix, right? Say it's Ed Reyes or uh, Gloria Molina. I mean, they've donated, some of them give their uh, archives to city clerk or UCLA or whatever, but it's like, we have no way to officially kind of contact them to, right Vince? Like talk about all the work they did 20 years ago. 
<laughs> well, they, they normally wouldn't talk about it. It becomes a huge conflict because they serve on so many of the commissions and, you know, the funding agency. So, but, you know, it's like I tell people, you need, we need to really make that ad hoc and then take it on to our new elected um, CD1 rep, which is Unisys, and start to spearhead it from there. And then, you know, any agencies we're going to have to deal with, the state, all, all of it is complicated with red tape because the state says we don't want to work with the city and the city says don't step on my toes. So you can use the Alley River as a good example of how many jurisdictions are in one project and they all got to get crossed, come with an MOU. So yeah, this one's going to be a long-term project, but I think we should take it on and really look into it on what, what the community needs are and find out whether it's sold or not and whether the city or there's any funding to purchase it. And and like Michael said, we won't know that all that's private. So it'll and pop up sooner or later. One thing we might have in our favor with the difficulty between, you know, state, county, um, city and all that is that um, the, the high profile nature of the Avenue 34 project and the controversy around that has brought this to everybody's attention. So this is in some ways connected to that because it's the contamination is connected. The it's the same it's the same area, and you know this the Avenue Thirty Four project is moving ahead. Um, it could be an opportunity for the same elected representatives who have voiced their support for the community's concerns about that project to lend their support in a way that could be constructive. Perhaps, you know. All right. Thank you, Michael. We have Emily. Oh, I just wanted to say that I would like love to be on that uh, committee. I don't know how do we. I don't know how we go about organizing that committee or whatever, but yeah. All right. Cool. That's all. Thank you, Emily. We have Gil. <clears throat> yes, just to uh, jump on uh, Shanti's, uh, we should get with uh, our new leader uh, in, in District 1. I don't know if anybody from the council has gone to them, but they're going to take office. And uh, we've got to, this is a new person. We don't, uh, we, this is a new era. It's not uh, Gil's deal anymore. So uh, we have to go uh, aggressively going out and uh, getting some relationships and uh, find out if they uh, are in tune with what uh, we'd like to do in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Gil. I do not see any more hands up. So no public public hands up. All right. So um, we're gonna. So there's no action on this, but we're gonna move on to uh, item number eight. Uh, a we yeah. have we have one hand up. All right. Just raised Daisy. Uh -huh. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay, so like I'm so curious about that. So, um, do we need to be on the board to be on, on the ad hoc that you guys are talking about? You do? Do you need to be on the board? Because no. I'm just like a. You can be a community. So who, yeah. So, who will be organizing this? I mean, any, even a community member could be the chair of this ad hoc committee. Right. And then my other question would be like, have you guys tried to like pull the like the deed or like even like the property profile on that piece of land? We have everything on this property going back to 1906, going back to everything. <laughs> so it's just a uh, city and state just do what they want to do. But sorry, I'm interrupting. Daisy, do you want to keep talking? Sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I guess, like, I don't know who, who is going to put this uh, ad hoc up? Because I, too, am, am interested in uh, seeing what we can do well, before some big corporation or some big, you know, investor comes and takes it and does whatever they want with it. Vince, this could be a new item, a future item at the end of the agenda, correct? And we can, uh, I mean... Exactly. It, it would just be the creation of an ad hoc committee and we'd give it a, a date and time you know, a start date and expiration date. And its primary purpose is to dig into the Avenue 34. So, and that can be done by uh, board members and the, com the community can be involved as stakeholders. 
So that's another meeting that people would have to organize and get an agenda with. So mm -hmm. if there's anybody that wants to spearhead it, just wait for the agenda item and we can put it together then. So I'm okay. having, no, yeah. We I'm can, sorry, you last, <laughs> so sorry. Last sorry, question. Yeah, they, Last question. So is that that uh, piece of land that they're doing all that cleanup or is it adjacent? Michael? I can answer that. It's adjacent. So it's, um, it's right next to the site where they're doing all the digging. It's currently paved with asphalt and they're using it as their parking lot. And there's like some, some like, you know, trailers they're using as their offices on that property. It's right next to the Arroyo River and it's right next to Pasadena Avenue. And um, uh, yeah, it's, it's right Thank next you. to- Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Daisy, we're having a planning and land use meeting on November 2nd and we can itemize that as an agenda item. And then it would be, right, we can ratify that counts, that ad hoc committee on the following general board, which will be at the beginning of November. So uh, I'll keep you posted. I'm going to email Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. For sure. All right. Any other public comments on this item? Or questions from Michael? I don't see any hands up. Okay, so we're going to move on to item number eight. Uh, one, so we I just penned up. Thank a, you, Michael. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So I penned up a letter. Um, we might want to add something to it, but it's just to the city. Uh, we want some transparency on this property. Um, basically, I found out around the time Michael saw it was for sale, I, I look at the CPRA request. So, you know, a lot of developers and environmental groups do in, uh, due diligence, investigative work with the city before they buy a property or whatever. They want to see if there's toxic soil or underground storage tanks, leaking storage tanks. So I saw that they were sniffing around. The city was saying that there's no, they don't have records of any storage tanks, which we know is false. So it's just asking, um, it's kind of like starting a whole separate thing besides the Avenue 34 site, you know? Cause this one's like a historically known site that's toxic. It used to have a skull and crossbones on the fence since the, I guess, eighties. So this is the letter, I guess I, I'll move for the letter, uh, motion to approve the letter. We have a second. I'll second the I'll, motion. Okay, so any board member discussion on the letter? I don't see any hands raised. Any public comments on this letter? I do not see any hands raised. By the way, this letter is like a, a doc, an official document that'll be a public record, like on file with the city in case anything happens in the future, right? Kind of a legal document. Uh, all right, so no public comments. So I guess uh, we're going to go for a vote here on the letter, motion to approve, uh, second by Vince, first by B. Motion to approve the community impact statement regarding. Avenue 34. Dry cleaning. At, yeah, at 3505 Pasadena Avenue. Sarah? Yes. Ben? Ben Matsui? I'll go back to you. Chente? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Nancy? Yeah. I got Ben. Benny? Yes. Emily? <laughs> Emily? Yes. Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? Yes. Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. That's 14 unanimous. Motion carries. Motion carries. I will be served. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everybody.
All right, so now we're going to move on to the next item. Item 8B, Vince, you want to roll with this? This is the wildlife? Yeah, so uh, I don't really have a supporting document on it, but we got a request from uh, Bureau of Engineers to uh, write a letter support, a letter of support for a planning grant from the US Department of Transportation, quote, reconnecting communities grant program. It's an application for the Taylor Yard community, quote, and wildlife crossing project. And so. That's it in a nutshell. But yes. Most people, most people have been seeing like the mountain lions that have been getting hit by the cars. So these crossings are meant to connect over the freeway so that we don't have that situation anymore. There's another one that was approved up north of us in the valley that's going to be put into place. Um, there's some controversy with it, whether it would work or not, or whether it could be dangerous or not, but you know, it still needs more study on it. And this is what the grant is for to do a planning, but also a study how its impact would be. Because sometimes we ask ourselves, if the bridge is coming into where there's more people, then the animals would cross over, right? And what would happen there? And what type? But I think it's important because they can't just, you know, people have encroached into the animals' habitat for too long. We have bears coming down, mountain lions, I ain't got nothing left anymore. And so how do we, you know, how do we build these so that we don't lose so many now, you know? So it's something to think about out there, but I don't know if Mel has something about it because I don't know if she's heard. I have something heard. about it. I just want to say the grant itself, it's what like Biden and Jimmy Gomez were talking about with this transportation money. So it's called the Reconnecting Communities Grant Money. So it's going towards infrastructure for bridges and stuff like that. Now, as I look deeper into the uh, documentation for the Taylor Yard, there is nothing about a wildlife crossing, okay? They just built that bridge that was like, how much was that orange bridge? It was supposed to be 14 million, but it was 47 million. Yeah. So it's like, they're trying to get this money. Um, but yeah, it's basically going, when it says for the Taylor Yard community, that's like what it's for. The wildlife crossing thing, there's nothing about it. That's all I have to say, sorry. Mel, Melanie? Here we go, sorry. Um, I, I don't have anything prepared or, I mean, any thoughts on this. I was going to talk when we got to the evictions and the pets, but um, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't have anything to add to, to this one. I apologize. No, it's okay. I just wanted to see your opinion on it. Oh, my, just my general opinion? I mean, yeah, listen. I mean, just anything like, like animal crossing. Like I've dealt with them before, right? And it's kind of like thinking... How do you cross them in the city from one bad place to another? Yeah, I, I, I just don't even feel equipped to like have an opinion. Like, and it's like, it, like it, this grants is for more research to see if this would be a safe option for them. Then that sounds like a good idea. But like you said, Vince, there's still like the jury is is out on, uh, especially in areas like ours that are, you know, so urban. Um, I'd like to think it would be helpful to them. I don't want to see another mountain lion dead on the side of the road, that's for sure. Thanks, Mel. Uh, Jared? Just a, a question, who who does the, if, who would do the research? Is this somebody through the city, the federal government? Is there a third party that's appointed? This would probably be a third party. You would think that the, the federal government or the state fish and wildlife would do it, but no, it's third party. Mm. And, and that's another thing about them, right? Because we, you can hold them accountable, but just like in construction with developers, developers do their own environmental uh, study pick and we don't have any access or word over who they pick. And so that study comes out always in favor of development and never has any issues. And that's what we worry about third party studies here. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, it's just basically 
the Bureau of Engineers is soliciting letters of support from neighborhood councils to secure these funds, but it's a FOLAR, you know, it's the LA River revitalization stuff for Taylor Yard, G2 parcel. So uh, this is just like in that um, report, right? It's kind of just like at the end, they have all these funding options tacked on at the end. So they hit us up, they needed the letter by October 6th to assemble their packet or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's like full our events. Who were the, you know. Uh, well, we, don't, we don't know who the grant people are gonna get yet, but the traditional ones that get them is Folar. Um, they had, you know, Lamas has gotten grants to do this and it, they're all questionable, right? Cause they're all 501. That's why a third party doing the report on it's kind of like, what do we need and how good are they gonna be in our community to get the feedback that we need to make a proper decision on whether this would be good or not good for our community. Yeah, so Vince, I don't know if we should table this item because did they did they have a sign on letter that they sent us already canned to that we could just pull up? No, I didn't I didn't get a sign on letter. I know they wanted to do um a presentation on it, but they never they never reached back out. Okay. So maybe yeah, we'll... Gil, Gil had his hand up. Vince? <laughs> Gil? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, my big question is uh, who presented this? It says uh, you're going to have a present presentation from the Board of Engineers, so nobody showed up, or what's the deal on this? I mean, we're over here trying to get stuff, information or anything else, or gather information, and the person who might have given all our answers, or some answers to the things that we come up is didn't uh, didn't appear, didn't come up, or what? What happened? But city departments sort of lobbying other city departments for support. So um, we get these all the time, letters, sign on letters of support. So uh, they send them to all the councils. And so, yeah, I guess it's just, uh, they're not here. A motion to table item 8B1. Yeah, so uh, I, I guess I'll move to table. Uh, do you have a second? I guess I don't need to second. second. All right, so we're gonna move on to the next item. Um, Okay, so discussions, uh, new items. Now this one's really important. Uh, item number nine, uh, discussion of possible action on to appoint two board members to the Hazard Park PAB. It's called a Park Advisory Board, right? So usually, well, historically, we have a, pub, a public advisory board for each one of our parks and rec parks in Lincoln Heights, right? Like Lincoln Park and um, the rec center, Lincoln Park Rec, and there's one for Hazard Park. So. Um, they're not really, so you saw how they're unveiling a playground at Lincoln Park this weekend, right? And we were kept out of the loop. There is no functioning park advisory board at Lincoln Park right now. And um, we have to inquire into that. And same with uh, the uh, one behind the 99 cent where they tore it all up and they're gonna pave it with AstroTurf. However, Hazard Park, uh, park uh, Recreation Center, Vince, you wanna talk about it? Yeah, I mean, uh, Gilbert there, really good guy. He's the park director. He reached, uh, we, I w was talking to him. He's the one that I talked to about the Halloween stuff. And he reached out that they are trying to put their park advisory board together for the very reasons that Sarah's talking about. They really want to get the public's opinion on these projects that are going to be coming down the way to Hazard Park and how they would affect the community like AstroTurf or park buildup or, you know, even there was one where they had uh, land that they were going to possibly give to a nonprofit, which, you know, I've always opposed the privatization of public assets. So these things are important to protect. It's another meeting to be added on. And I'm pretty sure, I don't know how many members he has yet, but right now, from what I know, I don't think there's any. So it would be nice to get some of our board members get experience on a park advisory board, because then we really should have one in Lincoln Park. Right, but there's a great opportunity to do Hazard Park right now that's within our district. So I encourage anybody that has the extra time or wants to learn more about it to jump onto the Hazard Park PAB uh, appointed list. Yeah, I mean, usually when the city has plans to drain lakes and like renovate parks, they dissolve the park advisory boards, right? Mm -hmm. So that is why that we don't have them for these things where the parks have been, you know, they have plans for them, right? So uh, 
The hazard park is really important because of uh, proximity to USC. And in the past, there have been struggles. For instance, they, they cut down all the old trees, right? They put the street right through it. People fought crazy. So uh, you're, you would probably have one meeting every couple of months, um, maybe, yeah. Uh, and yeah, so if there's anybody that wants to uh, be on this, Raise your hand or say it, say it now. <laughs> I see Amanda, Danny. Okay. Um, and remember, yeah, it's it's across the street from Ramona Gardens. Okay, so like that's uh, how many families? Fourteen hundred people at Ramona Gardens, and they have no representation either. And so, uh, you know, this is a. Uh, a highly fought over area it has a riparian stream of the Arroyo de las Posas going through it that got plugged up. Um, a lot of environmental justice stuff needs to happen down there. Uh, and uh, community outreach with Ramona Gardens. And so Benny, yeah, Benny grew up in Ramona. Or Benny, you grew up there, right? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, I was also part of the struggle that um, saved the handball courts. Uh, USC wanted to demolish them um, with their road. And we fought and um, we saved them. And uh, every time I drive by, they're being utilized by a lot of community members. Mm -hmm. So it was a great um, victory for the community. Um, they still built the road, but they, they, they curved the street around the handball courts. Yeah, I mean, I would be very, so uh, I guess I'll move to a point. I think, because Fernanda, you live right there on the other side, like right there on Maine, and you're very uh, attuned to what's going on at Lincoln Park and Hazard Park's part of the same system historically, it got cut off. So I would uh, move, move to a point, Fernanda and Benny to the pad. Um, I second it, the appointment. And just one note on the appointment. I'm gonna ask Gil if we can add one more and then we'll we'll take it up with Melanie and Anna Lee. Mm -hmm. If we can get one more member, if they're still interested in it. Cause I think it's a good experience and it's a nice park. Well, I think in terms of equity and you know, the city has that new equity and civil rights division, correct? Yeah. Yeah, uh, have two seats on both the Lincoln Park pad you know, we can create it, you know, basically make it happen. And then the Lincoln Park rec pad. So uh, those are four more seats. So uh, yeah, this is super important because you guys know uh, we've, our official position on uh, parks and rec is uh, we have problems with the privatization of our public assets, like the Dodgers dream fields. And it's uh, only getting more and more wild. The kids getting locked out. So, um, so any board member comment on the appointment of Fernanda and Benny to the PAB. Um, no. So I guess, okay, so we're going to go to a public comment on the appointment of oh, Fernanda. I don't know if Mel, Mel had her hand up still for a comment or was it just to. Uh, oh, no, it was just still up, but I'm happy to be an alternate if Fernie or Benny ever can't like make a meeting. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Anna, Anna Lee put her hand up. I don't know if she had a comment or. Anna Lee? I was to piggyback off of, uh, yeah, I was to piggyback off of uh, Melanie, but then if we're also going to have these uh, committees for the other parks, if they're, um, you know, um, which I would totally be into being uh, what I've originally raised my hand to be on, be on that, but. Um, I uh, wasn't aware of the amount of seats anyways, but um, yeah, happy to be on uh, a seat for one of the other parks. And then also how Melanie said uh, that she could step in anytime, maybe like, I don't know, have three parks and basically seats if there's like, like uh, you know, certain people, can there ever be any problem for me? Like, you know, if for All right, yeah, there's freaking up a little. So this isn't a committee of the council, this is a pu public advisory board. So this is a board of the city, the department of the uh, parks and rec. Um, 
in which they have their own structure and hierarchy. So we, we have to see how many uh, members they let be on it and the alternates and stuff. But if any board member wants to spearhead the Parks and Rec PAB inquiry for our other parks, go for it. Um, well, we've been having trouble even with our, right, Vince, the Dodger Streamfields Community Impact Statements, correct? Yeah, we'll check with the other parks just to make sure, and I'll check with uh, Gilbert for uh, Melanie and Annalie to see if we can get another seat there. And if we can, we can put it in. But we've got another one coming up too right now. The ARC needs a, a position. Oh, yeah, Alliance of River Communities. All right, so uh, I guess we'll vote right now, right, on the appointment of uh, Fernanda and uh, Benny, right to the PAB. So, uh, Secretary Sanchez. Vote is uh, for the appointment of myself and Benny for the um, Hazard Park Park Advisory Board. Sarah? Yes. Ben? Ben Wadsworth? I'll go back to you. Chente? Yes. Fernanda, yes. Yep. Nancy, Ben is a yes. Nancy, yes. Benny, yes. Emily, Emily. I'll go back to you, Sylvia. Yes. Melanie, yes. Jared, yes. Gil, yes. Steve. Yes. Selena. Yes. Esmeralda. Yes. Back to Annalie. Sorry, my phone keeps something out. So it was like reloading. Yes. That's 14 yeses. Unanimous. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to move on to the next item, item number uh, 9B, discussion on possible action to appoint a board member to ARC. Vince, you want to take this? So the Alliance of the River Communities represents the 17 neighborhood councils along the river. In the future, we're planning to expand it even further up the river into the valley. They don't have representation with the community to connect them. So this, this meeting's held once a month. I, I'm, I believe it's the first Wednesday of every month, and I might be wrong on it. I'm on the board, so it's kind of crazy sometimes. But we we meet monthly, and we take on the regional issues. So if something happens to us here, like Avenue 34, or like the Taylor Yard, we tend to work within all the neighborhood councils. So currently, we have right now about uh, there's probably about 13 councils that have signed on to it of the 17. But more keep coming in. So it's, it's an interesting board to be part of. You get to see regional issues and take and represent Lincoln Heights there. So that's that would be me. We need one more person to become part of the board. And then that spot, like I said, is one more meeting a month. If people are available, meetings start at 7 p.m. They start a little bit later because a lot of the people end up getting late from home and they just want a little bit of time to rest. So anybody has any interest, like like the PAB boards, it's as important. All right. So uh, does anybody want to uh, be on the ARC? Raise your hand. No? I feel like I got to raise my hand now. Vince, <laughs> <No. laughs> what time on Wednesdays? 7 p.m. we start. OK. Um, I, I'll, I'll give it a try. OK. Wednesdays is a big work day for me, but um, I'm willing to see how it goes. I should be home by seven. Okay, okay cool. So uh, any board member comment on uh, this item, the appointment of Mel? No, but I'd like to make a motion to appoint um, Mel, Melanie to the Alliance of River Communities as rep for Lincoln Heights. Second. Okay, so any board member discussion? Don't see any hands raised, any public comments. And the public, Vince, the public can join ARC as well, correct? Yes, correct. You can join ARC. All right. Any public comments on this item? For now? So we're going to move on to a vote here. Uh, so, Fernando? All right. Motion to appoint Melanie to the ARC 
board, seconded by Jared. Sarah? Yes. Ben? Chante? Yes. Yes. Amanda? Yes. Ben, I got yes. Nancy? Yes. Benny? Yes. Emily? Yes. Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? Yes. Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. And Esmeralda? Yes. That's 14 yeses, unanimous. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to move on to the next item. Uh, Nancy, you want to grab this one? Item number 9C, uh, the uh, offeranda this year at Epiphany. Hi, Sarah. Sorry, I'm driving. OK, so we have a, I'll just roll with it. So discussion of possible action on Dia de, Dia de los Muertos with a community offeranda at Church of the Epiphany on Altura Street at Sitchell on uh, November 2nd or 1st, around there. Um, we had one last year and it was amazing uh, where we had our own altar and all these community orgs made their own altars uh, with artwork and all the community could come in and put photos of their loved ones lost from COVID or just anybody. Um, and there was a, a, yeah, we had coffee, coffee and everything, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so Nancy, are they have they're having it this year, correct? Yes, uh, they have it every year. And um, let's see, uh, Lincoln High School did one last year, and then uh, a few other people. Um, yeah, so it was great. Uh, it's great for the community to get together and you know share. Yeah, Rosalio had a sort of um, big. Uh, altar, correct? Yeah, with the uh, yeah, I, Rosalio does one um, every year. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, so Rosalio Munoz runs the uh, Chicano uh, archive. Uh, what would it be? The, not the moratorium archive, but what would it be? Chicano history studies archive of Lincoln Heights East Side. It's a hell. It, the archive is at Church of the Epiphany, and he's always there, and he has got the archive. So. Uh, um, so this uh, action item is to basically we're just going to say that we're we're participating this year. Yes. So um, I guess uh, I'll move if there's a second on the item. If anybody wants to second it, I second the item. Okay. Cool. Uh, board member discussion. Don't see any hands raised. Oh, Melanie. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, it's such a great thing. And um, like if everyone could just take a moment to go around your neighborhood and, and just like knock on your neighbor's doors to ask if they have any one that they'd like to honor on the ofrenda. Um, I got a bunch of people last year who wanted to. Um, so anyways, uh, yeah, people are really excited about it. I've already talked to some this year. So um, yeah, thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah, Nancy made a beautiful um, altar last year with fabric and like flowers. And we had the Lincoln Heights whale on there. Uh, it was awesome. Any other board member uh, discussion on this item? No, so we'll move to the public, the community uh, discussion. Anybody from the public want to comment on the offeranda at Church of the Epiphany on November 2nd? Please raise your hand or press star nine. Okay, none. So we're going to uh, go for a vote here. Uh, it's first by me, second by Vince and so, uh, Fernanda. All right. We have Sarah. Yes. Ben. Yes. Chente. Yes. Fernanda. Yes. Nancy. Yes. Benny. Yes. Emily. Yes. Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? Yes. 
Jared? Yes. Gil? Yes. Steve? Steve? Steve, I'll go back to you. Selena? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. And Steve? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yes. That's 14 yeses, unanimous, motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so uh, we're going to move on to uh, just a couple community impact statements real quick. Uh, we're going to move on to item number 9D. Uh, Discussion and possible action on community impact statement regarding Council File 22-1073, tenant eviction protection slash pet adoption slash COVID state of emergency. Um, so I, I wrote up a, a community impact statement and Mel knows a lot about this too. Uh, so um, I guess I'll we'll pull up the letter. I guess I need to move, right Vince, to approve it, right? And we need a second before I talk about it. Yes. Okay, so um, I guess I'll move. Do we have a second? I I'll second. Okay, so I know that we have the eviction protections one next after this, but uh, so this was uh, a, a recommendation or a request written by LA Animal Services to City Council um, asking them to amend the um, ordinance for the eviction protections to make it so that anybody who has an animal for instance, the eviction protections made it so if you had an animal without permission or an extra roommate, you couldn't be evicted. So with the ending of the eviction protections proposed by, by for February 23rd, all these animals, landlords could make tenants get rid of the animals that they had, right? And so the, the LA Animal Services is freaking out because they're already uh, at the max with uh, abandoned animals right now. It's just gonna like triple, right? So LA Animal Services is urging the city of LA to make it so that anybody who has an animal already uh, can keep it until it dies pretty much for the span of its life and not be evicted. However, the city sort of penned up their edit to the ordinance this past week saying that tenants only have one year, like till 2024 to get rid of their animals. So it's one year after the ending of the eviction moratorium. So the letter that I wrote is saying that, it's saying a lot of things, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, Mel, do you wanna talk about the state of affairs at Lacey Street Pound? Yes, I would love to. Um, let me go hide from the kids real quick. Uh, yeah, so I think it's no like secret. And Sarah, I'm sorry, I probably didn't like, I didn't know when to send this to you. I drafted a CIS also, but what you wrote is great. Um, but yeah, so our all of our city shelters are overcrowded. Um, Lacey Street's no exception. Um, here's the thing too. If these animals are lucky enough to get like returned, a lot will end up on the street, which is a public health hazard. But um, if they get returned, there's no room for them in the shelter. It's already overrun. It's gonna directly um, impact immediately our euthanasia rates in the shelters. So you have you know otherwise happy, healthy animals being euthanized or put into situations where they are no longer a happy, healthy animal. Um, there's no one to walk them. There's no one to play with them. There's no consistent human interaction and animals need these things to be happy and healthy. Um, and uh, furthermore, the suicide rates in veterinary medicine are one of the highest, higher than even dentists. And it's even higher in shelter medicine. So, you know, you throw on top of that an influx of animals that they need to kill and uh, you know it's just a it's a disaster public health like mentally physically everything um also it would cost the city nothing <laughs> to just allow these people and these pets to stay in their homes on the flip side it would cost a lot a, a huge toll financial and otherwise um 
if, if there are no protections for them. So this is a big deal, like major repercussions and multiple repercussions um, if these uh, pets and their people aren't um, protected. Mel, you're a veter you work at a veterinarian, right? You're the manager of a vet. Yeah, I'm a registered veterinary technician. I actually, right now I work in rescue medicine. So animals who have no owners who are pulled from the shelters and, you know, are totally busted up, we repair them and find them homes. And there's just more than we know what to do with right now. And um, I, I can't imagine, I, I can't imagine there being more, like there's so many, we can't keep up and we're private. Like we're not even like in the shelter ourselves. We're just getting animals from the shelter to, to repair and, you know, help but uh yeah it's a, it's a disaster but this is what i do for a living this is how i spend my life and uh you know animals are they just you know they really deserve better from us and the state of our shelters is just really um a huge failing on the part of our city and this is really the least we can do i mean these people who house these animals are doing a huge service to the city because having animals in shelters is so expensive like you think about incarceration of people and how expensive that is and kind of extrapolate towards animals. It's the same situation. It costs a stupid amount of money and to have them in homes with people getting care um, is so much less expensive because the people, no one's paying for it. I mean, the city isn't paying for it. The people caring for the animals are paying for it. So it's just a no brainer. I, I, you know, I have nothing else to say. So this mo so this council ball, it's kind of wild. So the city, you know, last week made their little determination that the COVID evictions end on February 23rd. And they uh, approved some recommendations from council members or some motions for amendments and then uh, canceled some other council members' amendments. However, in that whole council file, they have reports from the housing department, all this stuff, but they don't have any report from animal services in there. This motion has no, um, there aren't any letters on it. There's nothing. And this kind of might be our sort of recourse here for uh, implementing some sort of change here with the, uh, the uh, evictions thing. Because right, Vince, the city hasn't um, ratified the ordinance yet, right? No, it's official to what they have already, what they voted on. They didn't take on the, the animal issue because one of the main problems is that a lot of people took on the animals due to stress and companionship during the COVID. Mm -hmm. So that would automatically put them in violation of the lease when the lease stated no animals and someone took in a dog or a cat or a bird. And that would trigger them to be evicted, right? So one of the things that they requested was that that be modified to accept those, those terms, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's a lot of legalities behind it, whether that's legal or not, whether the city can force someone to alter you know, a, a binding lease between, you know, the owner and the tenant. I think they should do it. I think they should let it play it out in court and see how it goes. Because if not, like Mal was saying, we're going to see a wave of pets coming in and then we all know the outcome of it, right? And I think that's one of the things that we need to prevent. So yeah, hopefully this true. letter, the, CS, the CIS puts it in so that they can invest, but they, they will revisit some of these amendments down the road before there was a request for them to be visited before the actual end of the um, moratorium to readjust some of the amendments. So we'll see if they hit the committees. I haven't, they should have made a special committee for it, but it might show up in the same committee that the moratorium showed up in, housing and community development. Okay, yeah, I, I think this one's gonna get pretty big. Um, also the housing, uh, the animal services was encouraging people to adopt during COVID. So therefore uh, the city should, you know, we were alleviating because all the pounds closed during COVID, right? Animals were running in the streets. There was nowhere to take animals except I think South Central or something. It was like two pounds open, right? So who knows how many animals got hit by cars and all that stuff, but people just found animals and they had to keep them. And so many of us like do, trap neuter release you know the city's not imposing the laws it already has on mandatory spay and neuter but this is crazy stuff right um uh but uh yeah the uh companion animal letters we could help people do that if you have ptsd but also 
uh, anybody can get a, um, what is that called? A C, uh, the letter to have a companion animal? Right? An ESA, yeah. So uh, look into that um, because these are family members. So, all right. So we have a letter, it's a little heated, but uh, these are family members and they're not animals. And so to kill them, that's uh, violence against our community. And when people have to choose between their animal or being homeless, they're gonna choose their, you know, I don't know. It's one of the most hardest things. And I think we think about it all the time, those of us who have animals. Fernanda's hands up. Yeah, Fernanda. Awesome. Yeah, um, I want to second Melanie's comments and also thank her for her work. And it also made me realize the cruel nature of this, of forcing people to just get rid of their animals. Um, it, it, it reminds me of like when I was in elementary school, we got a new uh, building manager and they always came with their own set of arbitrary rules. And one of them was you had to get rid of your pets in order to stay, if not, you'll get evicted. And getting even getting a companionship letter, you need that from like the psychiatrist or something like that, that costs money. Um, not a lot of people have access to those kinds of resources to get a letter like that. Um, trying to find a new owner for your pet and being a like if you have kids and you have to get rid of your pet, that's very traumatic for your kids as well. Um, it's just very cool. Um, so I support the letter that we have drafted, drafted up. Yeah. City council has blood on their hands. If they require people to give up their pets and those pets are killed. That's, I mean, it's not just my opinion that it's murder, but it is. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so we have a letter. So uh, we have a first and a second. So um, we, we have public comment. Public comment, um, yeah. Daisy. Hi, you guys. Uh, so <clears throat> I volunteer as, uh, I'm going to say as an attendee, I volunteer uh, at the animal shelter here on Lacey Street. It's the North Central. And uh, what they do is they, they don't kill animals. So I hope that that's not what it's expressed out there. I don't know about other shelters, but as far as LA, they do not kill animals. What they do, because we've already had, they've already had an influx of, um, pets that were surrendered because owners couldn't have them due to the circumstances and all the changes that you guys just covered. What's happened is they've rotated pets, who, animals. Whoever has a uh, space say, such as Chesterfield or Van Nuys or even like in, in West, the West West Valley, uh, they'll rotate animals. And, and I've even volunteered to transport animals. Uh, but um, yeah, they don't kill them. Uh, for the most part, what you guys are saying, yes, uh, it can get hectic in there for them. And um, they do run out of space, such as Chesterfield that's located on Avenue or Street, 60th Street in South LA. They uh, have been overwhelmed and it's even been on the news that the animals have been neglected because no one can attend to them. And a part of that is also because their uh, employees are, um, out with COVID, so they can't be there to attend to them. So they really needed help. Um, and what's available, you guys, such as the fostering, which you guys covered, you know, you could take in an animal temporarily, care for them, cover the expenses until a home is found. People could do that. People can also do a day, a day owl, uh, day furry field trip. They're called furry field trip, where you pick up a, a dog for the day for like three or four hours. Uh, and you take them out and and um, you bring them back after those three or four hours, you take it back. You can also go in there. What I do is I go in there and clean up. And there's also like a food pantry to give food out for uh, those that are struggling financially. They have dry food and they have wet food that they give for dogs and cats. Um, so there's things that can be done that are offered. And it, what sucks is that like a lot of people from the community, they, they don't know about these resources that are available, you know? Um, so anyways, that's all I just wanted to reiterate on, on the struggle for the animals. I have pets, I have a dog and two cats and I wanted to flaunt in, flaunt them as you guys were flaunting your furry pets. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you, Daisy. Any other public? Thank comments? you, Daisy. I don't see any more hands up. 
I just want to make a comment. So um, LA City's not no kill. All right. So there's LA Animal Services puts out a woof report. If you just look up woof report, LA Animal Services. So uh, just for the month of August, uh, let's see, uh, cats. Uh, so I can look up North Central Shelter, correct? So uh, <clears throat> cats uh, intake. Uh, 139, oh wait, what is it? Kittens, 181, dogs, 224. That's just for August, 544 animals. Um, uh, and it says uh, cat and dog live outcome totals, uh, blah, 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 blah. Non-live outcome detail, cats, dieting care two, euthanasia, 37, dogs, three dieting care, 18 were euthanized. So, I mean, and then if you, some of the worst shelters like uh, Carson, well, the ones with the highest death rates, it's just crazy. Yeah, there's a lot of euthanizing going on. And uh, they do move them around, but there's a certain point where the majority of the city is renters. So if the majority of the city can't have pets, uh, there's only so many homeowners that can adopt to those pets, right? So um, yeah, Wolf Report, look it up. Uh, and I guess we'll go for a vote on the uh, SIS. Right, motion to approve CIS, seconded by myself, I think it was. Um, Sarah? Yes. Ben? Yes. Chente? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Benny? Yes. Emily? Emily? Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? Yes. Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. Anna Lee? Yes. yes. That's 14 yeses. Unanimous. Motion carries. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. We're holding on here. Okay, we're going to go to the super important one. Uh, item number 9E. E. Yeah, discussion and possible action on community impact statement regarding Council Fall 21-0042-S3 and CF21-0042. Emergency Rental Assistance Program, ERAP, waitlist, eviction moratorium, May 2023 rental repayment, COVID-19 pandemic. So I have, we have a letter here. And uh, so it's like, I'll just read it real quick. Lake Heights Neighborhood Council represents 39,000 people, 77% of whom are low income renters. City Council is comprised of 15 homeowners and property owners. The city of LA is made up of over 70% renters. City Council is inherently biased and prioritizes the needs of Agla, who is one of the people on the council file who is lobbying them. Agla, who, uh, it's a landlord group, right? Uh, who have encouraged, encourages members to harass and illegally evict tenants throughout the pandemic and eviction moratorium. The language in the original ordinance stated that the eviction moratorium would last until August 2023, or if the emergency is ended sooner. Vague and misleading verbiage, if not irresponsible. Now the city is just advancing that date to February 2023. Although there was ERAP money, the city did nothing to notify tenants of said monies for 20 months. And it was only until the city co contracted with a litany of nonprofits to get the word out on housing is key, which happened around March this year, did anybody sign up. The state had its own portal, yet the city made people go through their quote, stay housed LA site, which was partnered with USC Price, harvesting data on our communities. The city did not hit the streets. The city did not inform the people. The data shows that the majority of non-English speaking residents of 4 million people were bypassed and didn't even get the relief. Those who did only received payment for March and April, 2022 because they were never notified of the program. The nonprofits hired by the city failed to even stable flyers to telephone poles or make flyers in Spanish. It was grassroots tenants organizations who hit the streets helping people sign up. 
There is no future relief and the city failed at outreach to properly distribute federal money in an equitable, timely manner. The people of Lincoln Heights are in debt, working multiple jobs, facing eviction and landlord, landlord abuse and harassment, which the city of L LA called illegal behavior, but failed to prosecute a single landlord. HCID was giving tenants incorrect information because the city employees there hadn't read Nithya Raman's private right of action amendment to the LAMC or even the ordinance itself. HCID was telling tenants it was legal for the landlord to give a three-day notice, even though tenants provided proof of application with housing as key and had submitted the COVID hardship papers, right? The city is confused. The city is not listening to the majority of the residents. And the, courtes the current city council is violating the city charter and must extend eviction protections and extend the eviction moratorium. So that's kind of talking about, those are all the points they bring, the city brings up like of their due diligence and how everybody got all the money that was, you know, out there. The city is like failing to um, take responsibility for their failure to notify uh, tenants uh, at risk of eviction of their, um, the federal money that was available to them the whole time. Now, um, Fernanda, do you want to talk about this at all? Yeah. So I worked for the LA City Rent Relief Program, and then I also later worked for the Housing is Key Program. And if I remember correctly, for the Los Angeles one, if you agreed to receive payment, then you were protected until 2024. Um, like those individual little contracts for receiving um, that rent relief. And I'm wondering if this decision also reverses those individual contracts um, and everything that is in this letter is absolutely correct. Um, most of our applicants were not Spanish speaking. Um, and if they were people that were working for the rent relief program, very few of them were bilingual. Um, so there was definitely, it was not an equitable process at all, especially because um, a lot of it required um, serious documentation to prove that you lived there. Um, um, and there were also a lot of landlords that just flat out refused to participate in the program. And so there was a number of tenants who were in need and um, just from the failure of the landlord wanting to participate, they didn't receive any sort of coverage at all. Um, and as we still see today, there's still a lot of financial ramifications of the COVID-19 layoffs and everything that happened economically during the pandemic. And I think ending it in 2023 is premature and not just for any of the renters that we have. Um, even though, and even when we did have the moratorium in place, people were still being evicted left and right. Um, the city did not do its due diligence, help never came. It was just to save space and make it seem like they were doing the right thing. Um, when I was working for Housing is Key, we weren't spending the money fast enough. We weren't giving relief fast enough. Um, it was just a total hot mess. And by the time we got to a lot of the tenants' applications, they had already been evicted. Um, so, and we saw that a lot in Lincoln Heights. We saw a lot of evictions. Um, yeah. And the fact that the process was not equitable, there was no due diligence, there was no follow up, no auditing. And now the city voted to end the eviction moratorium is just outright um, irresponsible and discriminatory. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I. So, like, the state housed LA after the city paired up with these and they contracted with these nonprofits to quote, get the word out at the end of the ERAP thing. They hit us up, right? And they sent us some flyers, right? They're having something at the um, the Youth Art Center, right, in the parking lot, and Fernando was there. However, they only gave us a flyer in English. And then we had to hit, keep emailing them saying, dude, we need Chinese and we need Spanish. And they didn't get it to us. So we just made our own flyers and stapled them all over the telephone poles. And uh, also with the ERAP in the beginning when the city kind of opened it up, like 20 months ago or whatever, one of the conditions was that your landlord has to accept it. So if they're not going to comply, you won't get it. So a lot of people tried and they were like, oh, well, screw it. My landlord hates me anyway. You know, they're harassing me or whatever. 
So they gave up and so they kept paying the rent and even though they couldn't, um, or they're putting all their money into paying the rent. And then later, when it got more popular with this housing is key, they only could get a couple months covered. So now those people owe the past bunch of months and there's no funding out there for it. And so that's what's gonna be scary in February or next year when, because we're 77% renters, the majority of our community could be thrown on the streets and uh, just horrible. And uh, I don't know why the city is not, um, you know, they're, uh, they're, when you look at the council file, it's all these letters from AGLA and all these landlord lobby groups saying how they're the victims. Mm -hmm. um, it's really uh, wild. Yeah. And just really quickly too, um, one of the distinctions that I learned while on these projects was that for the unincorporated part of Los Angeles or LA County itself, like this small area, they had their own rent relief program that nobody knew about. And if you lived in these specific areas of Los Angeles, like 90031, you didn't qualify for the LA city one. This is before housing is key was a thing. And for LA County, the majority, the max amount of relief was $2,000, which really isn't much considering the rent prices here. And so pretty much all of those people lost um, housing. And now with the eviction moratorium, it's pretty much um, a for sure thing that they will be evicted from their homes. And so that also means that we will be losing a lot of low income uh, units. And as we know, with all these loopholes, as soon as a tenant moves out of a low income unit, it goes back up to market value. Um, so we're gonna be seeing a huge shift um, in the housing market once all those evictions start happening. Um, and it's it already is a major crisis and it's going to get even worse. And so the city is just um, being blatant about where their, intent their intentions are, I would say. Uh, the, the median, uh, the household size in Lincoln Heights is like 4.2 people per household. And those are one and two bedroom apartments. So when we talk about like a, a apartment getting evicted, that's four people or whatever, you know, a child, a grandmother maybe. Um, multi-generational household. So Vince, what do you have to say about conflict of interest with the city council members being uh, landlords themselves? Well, <clears throat> as everyone, if anybody looks at the video, Mark Harris Dawson and another a council member recused themselves due to conflict. Remember all these ordinances that have been put in, they have never ever recused themselves. And that's part of the biggest problem with the way the city is run and how the charter was written because it's it centers itself always in in the homeowner right and in reality while the city's you know um building the city up it's making it into a renter's uh population which right now i think we're 70 percent of the of the population that rent so automatically most of those people on the board need to recuse themselves and so they only recuse themselves because they have on paper, open paper, personal, that they own property with income property on it. But that does, that, what, what there has to be is the um, ethics commission needs to come down on the 700 form and really look into whether they even have LLCs or anything that would um, connect them to um, uh, uh, being a landlord versus just a homeowner. That's a big thing in the city charter. So there's a lot of work that we got to do on this because you got more homeowners on that council that are going to represent and we can see it in the policies today. That's why they're, they're failing because they're not, they're not, um, they're not put into play. They're not discussed. They're not created by renters, but homeowners. Yeah. David Ryu, David Ryu. David it was Ryu. filmed that Ryu. Uh, he had a LLC with his sister. He was basically uh, making actions on like the CASP, the Cornfield Arroyo Specific Plan Zoning and his active reuse in Lincoln Heights. Meanwhile, he had a, a secret partnership with his sister where next to the Lincoln Heights Library, he co-owns these uh, this multi-family, multi-unit family property. 
directly next to the uh, library. And he uh, did not reveal that on his form 700. Um, when we talk about a lot of these politicians who are historically involved in the decision-making in our community the past like 20 years, it's a lot of them are invested and nobody know, really knows. So, um, because it's not disclosed. Um, the letters on this council call are truly, uh, they're elite, a lot of the actions are illegal by these landlords. They're uh, putting YouTube videos of their tenants' apartments and stalking their tenants and making fun of them. And um, hopefully they sue their landlords. Uh, yeah, but they're, uh, you know, the voices of the tenants were at the meeting downtown in front of city hall. Uh, I just hope the city sees that, you know, <laughs> them heeding to the desires of these uh, property owners is not uh, the equitable thing to do. Sarah, if I could put one thing in, it's it, it's really the, the people, the city are the wolves and they're going to keep eating the chickens, right? Um, just look at what's happening in city hall right now. You have almost a majority of the boards facing corruption charges. I mean, if that doesn't wake up the public to understand that there, there's not only like a collusion into it, right? But that there's actually proof people are being indicted. I mean, Karen Bass right now, that's what I think Old Puppet was alluding to, is part of the Wrigley Thomas machine, you know? And, and all these people that have been dipping their hands illegally. And I think to some degree, I wish we could find a really good lawyer out there that would take on this issue because it is going to, it needs a, a case that would set precedent to regulate the, the system better, to actually enforce these laws. I always tell people this, go to the charter and look at how the commission for rent stabilization is built. A, a landlord and a renter cannot be part of the commission, but a homeowner can. You have to ask yourself, who has more in common, the homeowner to the renter or the landlord to the homeowner? And it's always going to be the homeowner to the landlord because they both have this the similar items that they deal with funds so the renter by design is not represented currently and never has been in the city of los angeles and, and take into consideration the three percent rate increase a, uh, a year is a push out rate when you look at how that works does anybody get a three percent raise from anybody that's receiving public aid working or even social security so how do the regular people keep up with the raises they can't and that system's been put into place and continues to allow that to happen and they're supposed to regulate that to decrease it or increase it when needed it should really be decreased below the three percent but they won't do it because it's run by the homeowners and landlords and that needs to be changed immediately since the majority of the city right now is predominantly renters Okay. Thank you, Vince. All right. Any other board member uh, comments on this? Sorry, sorry, we're taking so long because we're going to go to public attendees comments on the uh, tenants uh, eviction moratorium ending in February 2023. So are there any attendees with um, comments on this item? Please raise your hand and press star nine. I don't see any attendees, but we do have board member Emily's hand raised. Emily? Oh, yeah, I just was, uh, you know, I was just getting a little riled up listening to this because, yeah, you know, uh, um, on the board uh, of uh, deciding, you know, about um, uh, breaking uh, Rachel is a chase shark. Uh, I know, it's a side tangent. I'm just going to be quiet. I just was getting a little mad. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, anyways. Oh, okay. Thank you, Emily. Um, any other board members? All right. So uh, we have a motion to, uh, I, I think I moved two seconded. <laughs> well, we're going to uh, go for a vote. All right. So motion to approve this DIS seconded by, I believe it was myself again. Um, Sarah? Yes. Ben? Yes. Chanta? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Benny? Yes. Emily? 
Yes. <laughs> Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? Gil? Steve? Yes, yes. Gil is a yes. Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. And Esmeralda? Yes. Esmeralda. For unanimous yes, motion carries. Motion carries. Letter will be issued to city council. All right. Now we go on to our last sis. Uh, number 9F, discussion of possible action on community impact statement regarding council file 22 002 S48 AB 2050. Lee, Ellis Act evictions, ownership requirement, apartment building. So we got a letter here. I'm just going to read it. It says uh, position support. <laughs> Establishing the city's position in its 2021 to 2022 state legislative program regarding AB 2050, which provides that apartment buildings must be owned for a maximum of five years before becoming eligible for invocation of the Ellis Act. The Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council representing 39,000 stakeholders supports this resolution to reform the Ellis Act. We ask the legislature and our legislators to approve AB 2050 and ask the city council to advocate for said measure. The Ellis Act has been abused by serial speculators and predatory real estate flippers to evict tenants and erase affordable housing stock in LA. In LA. Sorry. Most Ellis Act evictions happen immediately after the acquisition of a property. The act is being used by speculators and not by mom and pops, pops pop landlords, trying to get out of the rental business as was, uh, as was originally intended. Therefore, action needs to be taken to close up this loophole. The Ellis Act is used to tear down historic multifamily properties or to convert properties to condos. This process invo involves buying, flipping, and reselling multiple, where's my glasses, multiple buildings, which must be tenant-free in order for them to resell at a premium. This has resulted in long-term tenants being evicted and displaced from RSO units, and those units are put back on the market above market rate in most cases as luxury housing or co-living or covert dormitory operations. AB 2050 would require that an owner own a building for at least five years before using the provisions of the Ellis Act. It would forbid an investor from using the Ellis Act again on another property for 10 years. This fix would allow the original intention of the act for small mom and pop landlord operations to retire or leave the business while curbing curbing harmful speculative practices and the evictions that caused the death and displacement of our families. And that's a letter to city council. It's in support of AB 2050, asking them to be uh, in support of it. Any uh, board member uh, comment? We have Jared. Thank you. I. In, in theory, obviously, I'm, I'm in support of this. I My only hesitation is I have not had an opportunity to actually read the statute, the proposed statute, or see where it is in committee or what proposed changes there are. So uh, I would be hesitant to take any action at this point. It doesn't look like a vote is imminent or that it's headed to the governor's desk imminently. Um, so I would I would just ask for the board to consider maybe we wanted to have an opportunity to actually review the statute. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we can pull it up. It's a supporting doc. So like this this motion, it's not like we're trying to appeal to this the feds or the state or whatever. It's a uh, city council itself made a motion like, hey, let's uh, let's close this loophole. Let's support this AB. 2050. Right, right. I understand that. It's just saying just because because city council like identifies the reasons why, um, and then uh, we're just saying to city council like we support the reasons why you're stating this. Right. I, I again, oh. I would just ask the board to consider an opportunity to actually read, have an opportunity to read the statute before. This isn't Fernie. This isn't it. It's um item uh, nine up. It's just like three pages. So uh. Let's see. 
Uh, yeah. So it looks like the city kind of already acted on it, but we can still get a letter in because it's still uh, in. Uh, it still hasn't been uh, ratified by Vince. What is it like? You'll see here. So they voted yes. So there's the AB 2050. And then I have the thing here. And then there's just a final page with the status of it at uh, the federal level. So it says, Vince, uh, Fernanda, can you scroll down at the bottom of the page here? So Vince, it says um, red second time. Okay, so committee. Uh, refer do pass order to third reading order to an active file at the request of assembly assembly member lee so what happened with ab 2050 it's it looks like it's still stuck in committee okay so it's stuck in committee okay so we have time on this too but yeah all the thing is saying is for them to just amend it to uh make it so a property owner has to own the property for five years before they can lsi but um and that's it. And we're dealing with these Ellis Act evictions like crazy in Lincoln Heights with people buying the multifamily properties and then getting yeah, them out okay. and then tearing it down. And the city, the city is just making recommendations to the state. Yeah. So that resolution there is just the yeah. So uh, that's just the city saying that they want to support it. So it's uh, Paul Caretz. Yeah. Scroll back up, Fernanda. Just to the resolution there. Okay, there. So we're basically just writing this uh, not about the um, AB, whatever, but it's like about the resolution, right? Like what our opinion is on what the city should do or what their power or back up or whatever. Well, it, I, I think if board members need more time to review it, can we yeah. put it on the November agenda? Okay. We could we we'll, we'll just table it. Does someone second that? Because I I I do think that if what if if we have time to do it right now, since it's stuck in committee, it might be a good time to vote on it. Um, and I know we're all like super pressed for time, and we're all busy with other stuff. But the documents are in supporting documents, and we should remind ourselves to look through the documents here before the meeting starts, so I that we feel. Yeah, the, the 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 livelihood of our, you know, basically people are coming to Lincoln Heights now because of our properties being long lots and they want to do ADUs and tear down for TOCs. So like we kind of have to act on this. Um, this has been a loophole people have been talking about for a long time. Um, so I'm going to motion to move and to vote. I don't know if there will be a second, but I, I motion to, to I'll vote. I'll second. Okay, so we have a first and a second. Did we do? Oh yeah, board questions, right? Did we do that already? No, no. This is a motion right now, so it's a com it's board questions and then community and then vote. Yeah. So uh, any board comments on this? We have Emily. Give me the hands just raised. Okay, any I don't see any, any public comments, please raise your hand or press star nine. We have Goat Puppet. Goat Puppet? Where the hell did you go? Oh, I was over at the Studio City Neighborhood Council. They give me video privileges. You can see my pretty face on my screen, yes. So we're just trying to make sure we're keeping you on track. It's 8.33, yes, and you have your famous hat on. So we just want to make sure that you're keeping things on schedule. <laughs> Making sure that you're fighting crime. And if you see anything that you don't think is kosher, <laughs> yes. Just contact 
213-473-7008 and speak to what I think might be a major snitch coming to City Hall. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Now we will resume with our regular programming. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Goat Puppet. We have one more hand raised, Jerry. Yeah, I would, I would, I, I do think uh, that the point that we all, including me, should review these before the meeting is a point well taken. Um, that said, the letter does um, say that the board is endorsing the statute. And again, I would just voice to my fellow board members that the uh, these statutes, and I'm speaking from my own experience, uh, the devils are in the details. So while certainly we all support the underpinnings and the goals of the prime, the prime directive, as it were, of the statute, um, there, there's a lot underneath these that that I think bear further investigation if we're looking uh, looking at before we all put our names on supporting the actual statute itself. Mm, yeah. Thank you for that, Jerry. Okay, so any other board member comments, questions? Jill? Yeah, have a go. Jared, I'm with you on that. I, I we had in the executive committee uh, agenda that there was no hint of this so uh, at all and then uh to come in and uh you know three days later to uh see it on the agenda uh, i certainly wouldn't have had any uh opportunity uh to uh you know investigate and look into this and ha really have some uh, rational or sort of halfway confident uh information regarding it it just uh, is too short a time i mean it wasn't on the uh, executive committee agenda yeah the executive committee agenda is for making the agenda so uh anything can be put on the agenda during the meeting <clears throat> oh all right so uh we have a first or second uh, any public we're we already took a puppet right back to jared so we're going to go for a vote on the sis uh, it already has assists from two other NCs, one being Parker, one being East Hollywood, in support of closing the loophole on the thing. Yeah. Right, Just then, one, one last comment. I'm trying to look for the sentence that says the statute. I'm wondering if maybe we can reword that specific sentence. If that would make if that would make the board members more comfortable for that amendment. Support this resolution to reform the Ellis Act. Okay, so the, we'll just say that we well, support the resolution from the city. That's it. How about that? All right. So We're asking the the state legislators to approve AB twenty fifty. Uh, we're just ask we support the resolution. How about that? I've deleted the second sentence of the, the uh, letter. So motion is to approve the CIS with the amendment um, to remove the wording of the statute and focus on the support for the resolution. Um, so I will move forward to voting. Uh, point, point of order. Yes. Is it um, so we're voting on the amendment right now? Yes, I believe so. And then after that, to approve the CIS. Okay. Thank you. So vote to approve the amendment for the CIS. Sarah? Yes. Ben? Yes. Chente? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Benny? Yes. Emily? Yes. 
Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? No. Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? No. Steve? Yes. Selena? Yes. Esmeralda? Yes. That's 13 yes, one no. Motion carries to amend the CIS. And now, um, motion presented by me to approve the CIS, seconded by Melanie. Sarah? Yes. Ben? Ben? Yes. I'll go back. All right, Ben is a yes. Chente? Chente? Yes. Fernanda? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Benny? Yes. Emily? Yes. Sylvia? Yes. Melanie? Yes. Jared? Yes. Gil? No. Can you mute Gil? Gil is making a lot of noise. Mute, Gil, mute, please mute yourself. Steve? Gil, thank you, yes. Esmeralda? Yes. And Selena? Yes. That is 13 yes, one no, motion carries. Motion carries. All right, so we're going to move on to the final stretch here. Committee reports. So I guess we'll just go to A, Planning and Lenny's committee. I'm the chair of that committee. Uh, Sarah, and then Benny's the co-chair. And I'm going to make an announcement here. Uh, they're, they're going to have the Hillside Construction Regulations um, hearing, the City Planning Commission, on October 20th. And I have a link on the agenda. And so these are uh, construction protections for the hillsides here in Lincoln Heights. And they're proposing, they used to be only in 90210, you know, we had the presentation, 90210, and then they were trying to do it for Mount Washington. So we want it for Lincoln Heights. And we're also seeking, a, um, like in our old letter, our uh, position, we're seeking an ICO, um, a ban on the development of all new single family dwellings, SFDs in the hills just like Mount Washington has. And we're not homeowners association, we're just all renters. So let's see what's up with the equity, right? Two, uh, announcement of vacancies on the Lincoln Heights HPOZ board. That's the historic uh, preservation, what is it, HPOZ? <laughs> the overlay zone, historic preservation overlay zone of Lincoln Heights. Now that board, I have a supporting document for the sample agenda, all that, there's about, Five seats, three are vacant. Um, there's no representation from renters or uh, there's one person from Lincoln Heights on there. Um, so it would be important to get people on that. And I'm not just talking to the board, I'm talking to the whole Lincoln Heights. And you don't have to be a genius, like a, you don't have to be an architect. You don't have to be a scholar. You can be anybody who cares about historic preservation. Um, other communities have really strict historic preservation uh, boards, right? They complain if the bushes are cut too short or whatever. In Lincoln Heights, they're tearing down houses. So it's like, what's up, right? So when you look at that, when you further investigate the current board that exists, it's a real estate lady, and, you know, some other people. So there's no regular people on there. So we need to, uh, when I say regular, I mean um, non you know what I mean, pros. So we, we need uh, the community on that board. And so I'm just talking to the community right now saying uh, there are vacancies on that board and we have a supporting document with uh, all the contact info if you wanna um, hit them up. And uh, one more announcement. Um, so Thomas Street, so remember there were nine houses to be built at Flat Top by Henry Suarez. He bought up flat top in 2014 and the council, neighborhood council, Lincoln Heights neighborhood council at that time approved his nine houses at flat top. However, his develop, his uh, small lot subdivision, the Onyx 3-2 was denied by uh, 
the city planning commission, um, the vesting, what is that called? VT, VTT, uh, whatever, they're trying to subdivide the hillside. So um, he's now liquidating his uh, properties. The city has uh, terminated all of his applications for those houses at flat top. And we have the letter there. Now that means that, you know, now they're back on the market. Um, but in any case, yeah, they've been terminated. And uh, those are my announcements. And now I'm gonna move on to 10B, that's Vince, environmental justice. Environmental justice has not met yet in the committee and we should be having one in November, but we, uh, I'll move on to the outreach one that we did meet in, which we recently had. And we've made a lot of contacts out with, um, for example, like we got our Halloween event at Hazard Park and there's a great contact there with the park director. Um, we also just recently had our whale day at the um, Natural Science and Industry Museum, which was great. Thank you, Nancy, and everybody that took part in that. Um, we're also looking at um, getting our uh, promotional items out. So the committee currently right now is uh, searching on how we can make tote bags or, and really we want the public to give us um, some examples of what they might need because we definitely want to we want to invest our money in things that the public has a need for whether it's a tote bag or a backpack or something anything would help anybody's opinion both board members too you can send it to any one of our committee members so that it gets to us um, another aspect is uh, our outreach we would like for each of our area reps to at least take one one day out of the month or two, whatever they're flexible with, and hold an information table in their district. And I think that's important for us to be able to engage and get a, an outlook on what people need in their area so we can bring it back to the board and see what type of resources we can provide from them. Uh, the committee also came up with a, um, a community yard sale, uh, which had, which, um, Currently right now, that's we don't have a date or time, but we're building the outline where community members can have a sale while the committee can actually take on the advertisement and maybe we can have, uh, we have our sound system, so maybe we can have music or something. So a lot of exciting things happening and re always remember that people in the public can join the outreach without joining the board. We have room for stakeholders. So, and we're always looking for interesting uh, interested people to serve their community. And we also always need a lot of help in our committee. So thank you. Thank you, Vince. So we'll move to uh, Jared, item uh, 10C, Programs and Services Committees, or committee, huh? any updates or anything? There are no updates. I am eagerly, um, we have one one stakeholder from the community who has, who has reached out to me. And as of now, we are a, a committee of two. So um, come on in, water's warm. And so, yeah, the programs and services is looking for a coach, coach here, and that could be a board member or somebody from the community as well, Vince, right? But that they will be right. uh, elected by uh, Jared, by that committee. So I'm not, I can't appoint anybody or anything like that. So if any board, board members wanna be on that committee, email Jared. Yes, do. Cool. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, item uh, 10D, Tenants' Rights Committee. That will be Fernanda. Uh, so just a couple of things. Um, I did want to announce that the Section 8 wait list opens up October 17. I wanted to quickly share the website for that, which is hacla.com. This is the main page. You're going to scroll down. Right now, it's just information, but this icon, once you click on apply for section eight waiting list, it should have the application ready by the 17th. Um, the application wait list lottery does close October 30th. For now, there's just information on eligibility, um, income limits here, as well as some phone numbers you can contact. Um, since this opens up October 17th, I'm wondering, I think it would be a good idea if like um, I found a space where I can host like a place and have a couple of computers so people can sign up there and like 
help them apply for the lottery. Um, I would need help with that. And volunteers, if anyone's interested, please message me on that. Um, other than that, we've updated our tenants' right brochures, and we've already handed some of those out. Um, and that's it for me. Cool. And I just want to add that the Lincoln Heights Library, or apparently I read that the city library is like on the 17th because it's a 13-day window. The libraries are, they may be staffed with people who are going to help people do the applications. Um, so we should check into that. And then I want to okay. mention, yeah, the Lincoln Heights Tenants Union meets, is it the first and third Wednesday of the month, Fernanda? That's right, at Epiphany Church. And Sylvia can talk a little more about, more about that. Sylvia, do you want to talk about the Tenants Union? Yeah, uh, we just had our uh, first meeting of the month yesterday. Um, yes, uh, we're going to have another one on the third Wednesday of the month, which is a um the 19th that's going to be after the application so i think it's going to be important that um i can be the liaison to the group and let them know about this information um and fernanda the day that you need help um organizing and getting um uh just you know help at the link whether it's the lincoln library or somewhere else to help people apply let me know and uh, as long as we plan well enough ahead i can definitely help out thank you so we'll be in touch well, and I want to mention, so one of the things too, if you've already applied to be on a Section 8 wait list, you have to reapply again. That's one of the things that I saw. Yeah, so uh, you have to reapply again. So everybody has to reapply. Um, so we'll see what happens. All right. Thank you, uh, Tenants Committee. And we're going to move on to Elections Committee. Selena? Hi, everyone. Um, so the last time the election, the elections committee met, we discussed uh, the two upcoming elections that are taking place. Uh, the first one is the general state and municipal elections taking place November 8th. Um, the last day to register to vote for those general elections is October 24th, 2022. Um, you can go to allyvote.gov to register to vote or sos.ca.gov to register to vote. Um, if for whatever reason you're not registered and you want to vote, you can just go to your near, nearest polling place and you can submit a provisional um, ballot. Um, let me see. Everybody should be or like the vote by mail ballots are going to begin going out uh, October 10th, 2022. And whoever's requested a vote by mail ballot and is registered should receive it by November 8th, uh, which is election day. Um, the next elections that we also discussed are the um, Empower LA Neighborhood Council elections taking place May. For our region, it's gonna be May 2023. Um, youth, uh, let me see, the voting age is 16th, but youth uh, community members, 14 to 17, are allowed to vote for uh, youth seats. Um, and any, if anybody wants to request uh, any vote by mail ballots, you can do so at empowerla.gov. Cool. Thank you, Selena. And then we're gonna move on to uh, budget committee. Vince, is there any updates on that? No, there's no, bud no update on the budget committee. Okay, and then uh, uh, Anna Lee, uh, holiday events committee. Yeah. All right. Um, rules and bylaws. Ben, any updates? Hey, sorry. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Holiday. We're all we're all set. Um, oh, sorry. As soon as we have uh, uh, enough members to uh, to hold uh, uh, an election. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we need eighteen, right? Yes. So, uh, all right. And then Anna Lee, uh, holiday. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, the, as far as events right now, a little, uh, uh, we're just um, treading lightly after the, uh, after the carnival. So uh, we did have uh, prior, we're trying to, uh, you know, organize, which is a great thing 
now that uh, at Hazard Park we can get involved there um, because we did want to do something for Halloween. So uh, treading lightly and we'll uh, be uh, having updates on um, further holiday things that we can do on and uh, for, you know, Thanksgiving, but actually the parade since last year, uh, we had that full uh, Bogart happen. Anyway. Okay, cool. And then uh, item K, grievance committee, we don't have a chair or a grievance committee set up. So if anybody wants to do that, hit me up. Um, if you like to listen to complaints about council. Um, so, uh, and then item L, government liaison, that's Selena. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we haven't had any meetings. I've my hands have kind of been tied with elections and other things. Um, I've had a a resident actually emailed me uh, regarding having LAPD give some kind of um, update on the violence in the community. I don't think this particular resident was. Um, at our meeting when we discussed uh, the incident at the carnival. Um, but in any case, I emailed her our senior lead officer's information. And if anybody else would like his information, you can go ahead and email me at selena, S-E-L-E-N-A dot L-H-N-C at gmail.com. And I'll forward you guys that information um, if anybody wants to contact um, Officer Huerta or anybody else um, or any of, other uh, of our government uh, representatives I have their information and I can forward those to you okay cool yeah they briefed the press but not the commun community but it's on their website uh all right so uh request and motions for future agenda items number 11 here any we'll move to the public is there anybody from the public with any requests for future agenda items so we can put them on the list here I see one hand up Goat puppet. Yes, it's not a hand, it's a hook. <laughs> yes, let's have a committee, a discussion about United States of America versus Mark Ridley Thomas. <laughs> it's coming up next month, November, and we would like to know, did Karen Bass get ratted out already? Yes, because if she becomes mayor, we're not only gonna have an open council seat, we're gonna have an open mayor's office. <laughs> We'd like to know more about it. And I think we can start right here. And then let's also have a remembrance for the great Gil Tiberius Sedillo, who will be ending his political career. I think we should have a, a special presentation and give him a special certificate as we bid adieu. So he can go back to his real house in Alhambra, California and live in his real house and stop renting an apartment and grifting with that $290,000 a year salary. Isn't it gonna be terrible? He's not gonna make his trips annually to Mexico and Europe anymore. Yes, I know you're all sad too. So let's give him a, a big send off and then we can begin our new relationship with Unisys Hernandez, our new CD1 savior. So much to do and so few meetings that Goat Puppet can attend in a given night. Yes, and on behalf of the cat, he will make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> thank you for that. No, thank you. All right, so we have, uh, do we have another attendee hand up, Angelo B? We have Angelo B. Hello, can I be heard? Am I, am I, uh, can hear me? I'd like to thank uh, Goat Puppet for his comments. It's much appreciated. I do support the idea of having a motion uh, in the next meeting um, for the things that he was advocating for. I think it'd be a great idea. In fact, we should probably think about um, putting some funds aside, if I dare say so, for uh, some sort of actual um, get together of some kind to uh, honor the esteemed outgoing lame duck, very lame duck, I should say. Um, my name's Angelo, I am a business owner in the area. I will be applying for business rep. Uh, maybe we can add a, an agenda item for next meeting for that. I uh, should say that um, while I am a businessman, I also, uh, I also know that uh, the most important 
thing in our neighborhood are the residents. Um, do we, do we, is it, does there have to be a business rep position? Is that like a requirement? I don't know if we're, this is no cross talk. Well, I mean, the bylaws were written a long time ago, but we have three, three business rep positions, yeah. Because uh, okay. Lincoln Heights has had a huge business district until it sort of was decimated. Ah, uh, uh, okay. But there were local oh. businesses, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, because, uh, you know, anyways, um, um, yeah, I'm very, I'm very interested to, to apply for that. So if we could add a agenda item, um, I'll, I will be submitting an application this week. All right, cool. Angela, yeah, just head up to Amanda or on the supporting documents, we have the application that tells you uh, what to do. Um, so Thank it you, Angela. It will be on there, so yeah. You can also email me. It's my first name, Fernanda.Sanchez, last name, L-H-N-C, as in Lincoln Heights Neighborhood Council at gmail.com. For more information and to receive the application, um, if you already have it, you can submit it, complete it to me um, via email as well. Cool. All right, so any other uh, attendee uh, requested items? Please raise your hand or press star nine. Any board member requested items? <laughs> oh, we have another attendee. I'll go we have, here. go for that. You're ready. You're ready. Yeah. Okay, so uh, so he caught you. <laughs> nice. We're gonna move on to Vin Mr. V, Mr. Chante. Take it it's away. That, it's that time. So motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Um, I'll second it. It's nine p.m. Second. <laughs> okay. I was gonna say the cat. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposing. I don't hear no one opposing. Abstentions. Don't hear any. The meeting officially ends at exactly 9 p.m. Thanks everyone for showing up, public and board members. Take you care. Bye everyone. Bye. Good night.